So last time around, we discussed how to read in tabular data into R in a form that R can then process later on. And in doing so, we touched upon the topic of tibbles. And tibbles are the data structure that R uses to represent spreadsheet-like data internally. So in this lesson, we're going to be taking a more in-depth look at tibbles. So let us begin by loading the same example data that we worked with last time around, the one on the Galapagos land snails. To do that, we first invoke the tidyverse, because yes, we are going to be using those functionalities. So we invoke library tidyverse. And after that, we have access to the read dilim function that will lead, read in the contents of the file. Again, this first of all assumes that the file islandfl.csv is already in our working directory. And second of all, this is a CSV file, as we can verify by looking inside it, which means that the delimiter that separates entries in different columns is the comma character, which is why delim equals comma has been specified here. And if we do that and look at the output from this function, we see our old friend, this table uh, of the land snails uh, from Floriana Island on the Galapagos. Each row of the table is a single individual, tells you which habitat it comes from, humid or arid, which species it belongs to, what is the measurement of its shell size, and what is the measurement of its shell shape. So let us take a more in-depth look at tibbles. Here's the output from the previous slide. And I should mention before going into that is that if you hear the phrase data frame, which you might do because on online uh, sources it's very often used, think of the same thing as a tibble. So a data frame and a tibble are for practical purposes basically synonymous. There's a nuance of a difference between them. The data frame is an older base R construct and the tibble is sort of the tidyverse reimagining of the data frame. It has small improvements over data frames in it. In this course, we're going to be using tibbles exclusively, but whatever you might know of data frames will most likely work with tibbles as well. So uh, you do not need to feel that we are being exclusive towards tibbles. Anyway, here is the output, and we've already discussed that at the top, there's a little comment that says that there are 223 rows and four columns to this data. Okay, so how should one actually conceive of a tibble like this? The best way to think about it, in fact, it is a very accurate way, is that each column of this tibble is itself a vector. And that is a correct way of thinking about it because each entry in, in the columns has to have the same type. So really, the entries form a vector in each column. And what are the types of those columns? They are written right underneath the column names. So you can see that there is CHR written under habitat and species and DBL under size and shape. And we've discussed this last time, but it is good to review that CHR stands for character string, whereas DBL stands for double precision numerical value, which is just a historically uh, contrived way of saying that it's a number. So whenever you see DBL, it is a number. There are other types that columns can have. For example, it could be LGL, standing for logical. If you see that, you know what that means. Okay, so what we've discussed is that each column of the tibble can be conceived of as a vector. And the tibble itself could be thought of as many of these vectors glued together side by side. And the thing is, each of these columns has to be a vector, which means that the entries within the column have to have the same type, but the entries across columns do not. And that is why it is perfectly legal to have two columns here that have the type character string and another two columns that have the type number. So that is absolutely legal. Within a column, you have to have the same type, but the different columns can have arbitrary types within a tibble. So we can actually demonstrate explicitly that the columns of a table uh, of a table are actually just nothing else but simple, normal, good old vectors. In order to do that, let us read in the data file again, but let us assign it to a variable called snails, as you see at the top, so that we can refer to the, it by that name instead of having to write out the whole function that reads in the file. 
Then there's a little piece of syntax that you can learn here. You can use the dollar symbol to extract a column as a vector. And the way you do that is you write down the name of the table, like snails, then you write down the dollar symbol, and then the name of the column that you want to extract. So for example, we could define another variable called sizes that will have the contents of the size column in the snails dataset. And the way we do that is just assign to this sizes symbol snails dollar size and that will extract just that one column from the snails data set and then we can do all sorts of operations on it that we can do on vectors for example we can calculate the average of sizes which again is just a simple vector at this point or we can extract the first five entries of the vector using the bracket notation so we write down sizes and then within brackets, one column five, which, which uh, if you remember, translates into a vector uh, consisting of one, two, three, four, and five, which means that we are extracting those five entries from the vector, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth entries. And that is what we see in the output at the bottom. Uh, those are the first five entries in this vector. One can do the exact same thing with other columns of the table. So for example, if we say snails dollar habitat, that will extract the column habitat as a vector. And if we then want to access, say, the third to seventh entries, so the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh entries of that vector, again, we can just use the bracket notation to do exactly that. And then you see the output. It's some combination of humid and arid zones because those are the two habitats that are available. Incidentally, notice that it's perfectly legal to use the bracket notation after some more complicated expression that results in a vector. So that is perfectly fine. One doesn't have to first assign snail's dollar habitat to some other symbol and then index into that. It is perfectly fine to just say snail's dollar habitat and then use the brackets after that expression and that will extract the appropriate entries from that vector as well. So a tidyverse alternative to using the dollar notation may be a little neater, although admittedly it is a bit longer notation, is to use the pull function. So pull works in the same way, except pull takes two arguments. The first argument is the table from which we want to extract things. And the second argument is the name of the column that we want to extract as a vector. So here we define another vector called sizes2 because sizes we've already used. So sizes2 is pull snails comma size, which means take from the snails table the size column and extract them as a vector. And if we do that, you see that it works exactly in the same way as the original sizes. So sizes 1 to 5 extracts the first five entries of that vector, and sizes 2, 1 to 5 extracts the first five entries of that other vector, but the two vectors are really containing the exact same data because the dollar notation and the pull function do the exact same thing. So far, whenever we were looking at the output of a tibble, we only saw the first few rows. And that is deliberate. The reason for that is that the system doesn't want to overwhelm you with all the output. So uh, data files that have thousands or even more rows, it would be very inconvenient if all of that was just dumped into your console. So that is why only the first few rows are shown. But sometimes, of course, you would like to see your full data and in a form that is easy to access, easy to scroll through, easy to see. So in order to facilitate that, one can open a graphical way of looking at the data, much like one would see it in a spreadsheet program. And the way to do that is with the view function. So if we type in view of snails, then this is the output that you will be getting. And this is scrollable. You can move back and forth. On this slide, I'm only showing you the first six rows just to save space. But when you do this, try this out in RStudio, you will be able to look Look through the whole file without any problems. Incidentally, the view function in its original form should be spelt with a capital V. However, as long as the tidyverse is loaded, it has the same function, the exact same function implemented with the lowercase v as well. So for convenience, you can choose whichever version you want to use as long as the tidyverse is loaded. So you won't have to remember to use a capital V. You can use either. 
So now we know, of course, that one can read in the contents of files into R using the readDilim function, for example. But the opposite is also possible. If we have a tibble, wherever it might have come from, it is possible to write it out to disk using the writeDilim function. And the way this function works is exactly as you see on the slide. It takes three basic inputs. The first input is the tibble that you want to write on disk. The second input, called file, is the name of the file that you want to save it under. So for example, if we loaded this uh, tibble called snails and we want to save it under snails.csv, then we just specify snails.csv as a character string, so we have to put it in between quotation marks. And finally, since this is going to be a delimited file, we have to specify what kind of delimiter we want to save the file with. In this case, we are aiming for a CSV comma separated value file, and therefore we specify the delimiter as a comma. Needless to say, it is possible to save these files in other formats as well. For example, if we wanted to save it in the form of a tabulator separated value file, then we would specify the delimiter as backslash t, which if you remember from the previous lesson, is a representation of a single press of the tabulator key. So this is how we represent it. This is how we make sure that the system understands that we're not talking about a bunch of presses of the space button, but we're actually meaning a single press of the tabulator key. Or if we want to save our file with a space separated format, which is perfectly legal, we haven't talked about it yet, but why not? It's just going to be the space character separating entries in different columns. Then you can also do that. And then you have to specify the delimiter as a single space. And that you can indeed just press the space in between the quotes and the computer will understand that as standing for a single space delimiting the different uh, column entries. At this point, I have to insert a little bit of preaching. Namely, be absolutely sure never to overwrite original data files. So if you load in some data, make some modifications, then save the modified data in a different file than the original one. So one very typical thing that will happen is that you receive some raw data. And the raw data are very often messy and difficult to work with. So you will do some transformation to tidy it up. And then there could be a temptation to simply overwrite the old, ugly, messy data set with your new, beautiful, tidy one. Do not ever do that because, for example, if it turns out later that you made some slight mistake in tidying the data and it's not quite correct what you have, then by overwriting the original data set, you've lost the thing that you could build on. Instead, the way to go is to save both the new data set in a different file as well as the R program you use to transform the original messy data set into the tidy data in, an, in its own R script. So by having those, you have a fully reproducible workflow that uh, other scientists can reproduce, first of all. And second of all, one that will work even if it turns out later that there's some missile, slight mistake in the way you tidied up the data. In that case, you will not need to be frustrated. All you will need to do is to rewrite your R script a little bit, and that will produce the correct output. And then you can save that uh, again. The point is, again, I repeat, do not overwrite original data files. Treat them as sacred and untouchable only for reading, not for writing. So up to this point, we've only been using tibbles that were read in from files using the readDilim or readCSV or readTSV functions. But it is also possible to create tibbles by hand on the fly. And this can be done with the tibble function, which is part of the tidyverse. And the way it works is you write down the name of the function as usual, everything is standard there. But inside the function, you specify the names of the columns and then you write down equals and then specify a vector that should be the entries of that given column. So for example, in this case, we have two columns. One is called species and the other is called height underscore M for height in meters. And the first of these has the vector S gigantium, Q rober and F grandifolia as its entries. Incidentally, if you didn't know, S gigantium is the sequoia tree. Q rober is the oak and F grandifolia is the beech. 
And then in the second column, height m, we specify a numeric vector of three entries, 87, 28, and 31. Those are assumed to be height measurements for each of these trees. And if you enter this table, then what you get back is what you would expect, a tibble with three rows and two columns. The two columns are species and height, and uh, species is a character string, height is a number, that is DBL, which again stands for double precision numerical value, or just good old numbers, and you have the entries as expected, under species you have S. gigantium, Q. rober, and F. grandifolia, and under height you have 87, 28, and 31. So that is all well, but there's still one aspect of entering data by hand in this way that might just appear a little bit jarring. Namely, that when we enter the individual columns, like here, they are laid out horizontally, naturally, because we are specifying individual vectors, one after the other. But when those data appear in the actual output, they are arranged vertically, one on top of the other. And it would be nice to have a function that allows us to input data in a way that looks more like this arrangement here than the one seen at the top. Now, this is exactly what the triple function allows us to do. So the triple function is similar to the tibble function. It is also a built-in function into the tidyverse. And it stands for, it is shorthand for transposed tibble. So transposition of a table just means that the rows become columns and the columns become rows. So exactly what we want here, instead of entering the entries of columns in uh, sort of row-wise, we want to enter them column-wise. So let's see how it works. The triple function, first of all, will take the names of the columns and to designate that those are column names, we have to prepend them with the tilde symbol or wiggly line that one over there. So tilde species designates that species is going to be the name of the first column and tilde height underscore m designates that height underscore m is going to be the name of the second column. And then we write the entries belonging to these columns one under the other. So we see S gigantium here, for example, that will be the first entry in the species column. Q rober will be the second entry in the species column, and F grandifolia will be the final entry in the species column. And the same for the height entries. And if we run this, then we will see that we get back a table that is exactly the same that we had before. The only difference is that now we can enter the data in this slightly more convenient way. Um, I emphasize that there are no layout rules to the triple function. Nothing tells us that we have to align the entries that we have done so. It just wouldn't make much sense not to do that because the whole point of the function is that if we do this, then the way we enter the data is the way it will appear in the output. But R is still a free format language, so you could have put in all of this information in a single line uh, and put in no spaces in between them. That is perfectly allowed, and it would have given us the exact same output as here. It would have been just a bit more meaningless because it would have been a jarble, and this way we've arranged the data in a way that makes it clear what belongs together with what other things. So that's it for today. We've taken an in-depth look at tibbles in this lesson, and I will see you next time around when we will be learning how to manipulate the data in those tibbles.